Good morning, guys. It is great to see all of you. Before we get started, I have two things for you. One of them is serious and awesome, and the other one's a little bit less serious. So I'm going to start with the serious one. The serious one is, to my right, on the left side of the stage for you, we have a white rose. What that white rose uh, indicates is that someone connected to Gateway Church recently gave their life to Christ. Uh, This, yeah, I mean, it's huge. This particular situation is, uh, is, is kind of sweet for me. I, I had the opportunity to walk uh, alongside uh, the woman. It was her husband that had accepted Christ. He's been uh, pretty ill lately, and it was just a pretty cool thing. A couple of weeks ago, she came up to me on Sunday and said that her husband had prayed the prayer. Uh, and that's what we're all about here at Gateway Church, man. More than anything else, we're about lives being transformed by the gospel. We believe that Jesus is the only way to really live life, and certainly beyond this life, he's the only way to heaven and back to restore relationship with God. And so that's a pretty awesome reminder of that, uh, seeing those white roses. That's the serious and awesome one. The less serious and less awesome one is uh, the Cowboys play the Vikings today. And uh, if you don't know, I am from Texas. And so my allegiance is where it is and I have the microphone. And so there you have it. Uh, Go boys. All right. I have a question for you. How many of you like to be comfortable? Like to be comfortable. If anybody's not raising their hands, you're a liar. Uh, We all like to be comfortable. Now, when I think about being comfortable, a few things come to mind. Uh, For you, maybe it's one of these things. The first might be, you know, cuddling up in your PJs on the couch with a cup of coffee or hot chocolate, whatever you like, watching a movie. Anybody like that? A few of those kinds of folks here. Okay. So what about this one? A stress-free life. Ooh, yeah, I see two hands back there. I'll come one of you. Yeah, that one's comfortable. What about this one? Not having to make any tough decisions. Yeah. Jesus is the most remarkable person in history. And It's clear because of some of the things that he is. He's a great teacher. He's a religious genius. He's a movement leader, a social revolutionary, a lover of people. But one of the things that Jesus has a tendency to do at times is to make people uncomfortable. Specifically, Jesus challenges people often through the scriptures. I actually was having a conversation with someone, oh, a few months back, and and I kind of came to a little bit of a of of a moment of realization that I can't find a single time that Jesus speaks in the Bible where it doesn't challenge at least someone. Whether it's us today or the person in the story with him, whether it's a harsh statement or a statement of kindness, at every single point, Jesus is constantly challenging. And usually that makes the people that are in his audience very uncomfortable. Today, In the text that we're looking at, Jesus is creating an an uncomfortable environment, but the reason that he's doing so is because he's forcing a decision. He's forcing people to come face to face with a truth or with a situation that they simply can't ignore. And the reality for us is that while these decisions are really specifically for his audience, you know, I mean, he's, he's talking to a group of people, they transcend to us. And there's some pretty challenging pieces. I mean, there's, there's some pieces that if you're a follower of Jesus, it kind of makes sense and it's not too bad. But where we're going to spend a big chunk of our time is in a very, very challenging place. A place where we have to make a decision as to whether or not we're going to live that way or not. And so the question that I'm going to ask you at the end, I'm going to give you right now is very simply this. What is it that you're going to do? Are you going to follow the challenge by following Jesus, make the right decision, or are you not? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, Lord, so much for, again, another person that is kingdom bound because they said yes to you. Lord, I pray that more and more people uh, connected to us would say yes to you, Lord, so that heaven would be filled with people uh, that we've had the opportunity to impact uh, for your fame and for your kingdom. 
God, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would uh, soften our hearts to what you want to say. Uh, Lord, there's a lot in there. You know that. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to have receptive hearts. And Lord, I just pray that you would remove my words and let only what you have to say come through, Lord. No agenda, no nothing, just what you want and nothing else, God. I pray for clarity, and I pray, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you've got your Bible, why don't you grab it? Turn to Luke chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, I will have the text on the screens behind me. We're going to start at verse 54 and then read a little bit into uh, chapter 13. And so uh, Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 54. Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, when you see clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower and you're right. When the south wind blows, you say, today will be a scorcher and it is. You fools, you know how to interpret the weather signs of the earth and sky, but you don't even know how to interpret the present times. Why can't you decide for yourselves what is right? When you are on the way to court with your accuser, try to settle the matter before you get there. Otherwise, your accuser may drag you before the judge who will hand you over to an officer who will throw you into prison. And if that happens, it won't be, you won't be free again until you have paid the very last penny. Chapter 13. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Jesus asked. Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, and I tell you that unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. So there's a lot in the text that we're looking at today. And through this series, and actually through quite a long period of time, we're approaching a year now, we've been observing the life of Jesus through the lens of a man named Luke. Now, we haven't talked about Luke as a person in a little while. Luke was a physician. He was very, very diligent in the way that he uh, took account of Jesus' life. He interviewed a lot of people and he wrote two volumes. One is the book that we're studying now called Luke. The other is After Jesus Ascends. It's a book that in your Bible is called Acts. Now, the plan is of this point is not to go directly into Acts after, uh, although we could. I don't know. If you've got an opinion, you can tell me if you want. Uh, anyway, uh, that's a continuation of the church and the birth of the church. But what Luke did beautifully and what I have loved so much about Luke is we see truly the, the full picture of who Jesus was. I mean, character trait wise. Certainly he was this kind, compassionate, loving guy. He was one that challenged people. Uh, specifically, he, he called out the religious elite. But today, this challenge that he has for us, I believe, is a challenge for a crowd of people that he hasn't done much uh, challenging of, right? Like he's, he's had this crowd around him. He's engaged them a little bit. He's taught. He's performed miracles in front of them. But today he calls them to the quick. You need to make some decisions about me. Now, the way we're going to break this text up is into three parts. Um, they fit together loosely, okay? Uh, thematically, there's a little bit of a challenge to the way that they all kind of fit together. There's a lot in here. We're going to talk about a lot of things. This might be one of those sermons that hits you in a different way than it hits someone else, okay? So we're going to try to touch a lot of stuff in a short period of time, but I just want to warn you. Three parts, all of them circling around what kind of decision are you going to make about Jesus, okay? So let's start with the first one. In this first section, which is the end of chapter 12, I'm calling Decide Quickly. All right, let's read verse 54 again. 
Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, when you see clouds beginning to form from uh, uh, to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower, and you're right. And when the south wind blows, you say, today will be a scorcher, and it is. You fools, you know how to interpret the weather signs of the earth and sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. Why can't you decide for yourselves what is right? So Jesus, he uh, is talking to the crowd, as I said. This is the first time, really specifically, or the first time in a while that he's addressed them specifically. He's been talking simply to his disciples, his closest followers. And he starts with this sort of uh, illustration, if you will. He says, hey, you guys can tell that it's going to rain when clouds start coming in from the west. Hey, you can tell that it's going to be hot when the wind blows from the south. And both of those things would be true in Israel. When clouds come from the west, it's coming from the Mediterranean Sea, and it means rain. When wind comes from the south, it's coming off of the hot desert, it means it's going to be hot. And what he says is, you can interpret all these signs, but you cannot figure out what's happening in the present time. Now, what he's saying is, you can't figure out that I'm the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah. See, Jesus has been with these people. He's taught openly. He's performed miracles. And most of the people in the crowd are crowd people. They're on the edge. They're not in it with Jesus all the way. They're there to see if he's going to do something crazy or cool so that someday they can tell their grandkids, I was there when Jesus did that. Or they're there thinking at some point Jesus is going to take on the mantle of king and he's going to go in and conquer the Romans. And if I'm in his posse, then I'm going to get rich. But yet time after time, Jesus is taught a very different message. And so he's saying, you guys can't even recognize what's happening in the present times. And then he finishes with this statement at the, or excuse me, at the beginning of verse 57. He says, why can't you decide for yourselves what is right? Now, this is not a question about morality. This is not why can't you figure out the right way to live versus the wrong way to live. It's why can't you figure out that you are meant to follow me? Why can't you figure it out? It's not complicated. Jesus' ministry has been clear. And so the first challenge for us, and again, for many of us, I think we're in a place where we've made that decision and we've said, yep, I believe that Jesus is who he says he was, that he's the Messiah, that he's the Savior. Again, we have a white rose on the stage identifying that someone else has made that decision. But you might be in a place this morning where you're like, eh, I'm not really there yet where you haven't said out loud, confess with your mouth that, that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. That's what it takes to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus, I choose to follow you and I believe that God raised you from the dead. If you have not made that decision today, then the first challenge for you is to make that decision. But it's not simply that. Jesus continues on in verse 58 with a quick story. He says, when you are on the way to court with your accuser, try to settle the matter before you get there. Otherwise, your accuser may drag you before the judge who will hand you over to an officer who will throw you into prison. And if that happens, you won't be free again until you have paid the very last penny. And so this story is basically, get your stuff figured out before it's too late. And so while, yes, the decision point, baseline decision point for all of us today is what are you going to do with Jesus? That's the first one. It is not an unending amount of time that that decision will be open to you. And what I mean is this, your life could be required of you tonight. And if you're on the fence And if you're like, the men make the decision today. It doesn't mean you have to have every question answered. It doesn't mean that you got to be all the way there. You might still have struggles. I still have struggles. I still have seasons. We all have seasons. But if you've not said, okay, I am going to make a decision to follow Jesus today, then do so. Then do so. And that's the first thing that Jesus tells us to do, encourages us to do, is to say, decide and do so rapidly. Now, from this point, 
Jesus introduces a very different theme. The second section is where we're going to spend a lot of our time. There's actually kind of two parts to it, and you'll see where that fits here in just a second. But he deals with one of the elements that is actually critically important to following Jesus, and one that I think is probably going to be the piece that challenges us the most. And that's what this word is that we're going to use to identify our second section, and it's the word repent, okay? So let's look at uh, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 13. Again, there's a fair amount of stuff in here, but we'll get through it. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee, Jesus asked? Is that why they suffered? So Jesus, the setting is, he, he's got this crowd around him. He's just addressed them. He said, guys, can't you make up your mind about me? You need to. Eventually, it's not going to happen, you know. You're not going to have the opportunity to make the decision at some point, and you're going to be sad if you didn't, right? And so, so he goes from there, and then somebody comes up to him and says, hey, did you hear about these guys that were murdered, these Galileans that were murdered? And Jesus responds with this interesting question, which we'll get to here in just a second, about that murder. But basically what happened is Pilate, he was the ruler of the Judean region at this time, during a ceremony, likely based on the context clues, it was Passover. There are some Galileans that are in the process of doing sacrifices. Likely, they were being accused of sedition or of creating, you know, distrust of Rome or whatever, sowing rebellion into other people. And Pilate sends some guards and murders these people right as they're performing sacrifices. In fact, in some translations of the Bible, it says that he mixed blood with the sacrifices. So in other words, they're killing lambs in the sacrificial system. Somebody comes up, kills them, and all the blood gets mixed together. It's kind of gross, I know. But this is what someone comes up and tells Jesus. Now, on the outside, it looks like just really sad news. And the question that Jesus asked, which again, we'll talk about in a second, looks a little bit crass or a little bit harsh. But the thing is, is there's something in the tone here that I don't think we pick up on very easily. There's a fundamental belief in first century Jewish thought that tragedy happened to you because you deserved it. In other words, if something like this occurred, it was because you had it coming, likely because you had some kind of inner dark sin that had not yet been revealed, and God finally was saying, bang, I got you, because you never would finally confess that sinful behavior. That was a common idea in first century Judaism. And so, based on Jesus' response, I believe that what actually happened wasn't, hey, here's some random information, oh, it's so sad, but rather, it was, hey, Jesus, did you hear about those guys? I wonder what they did. You see, because then the opposite is true if something bad doesn't happen to you, then the expectation is, is that you don't have hidden sin. And so by asking the question, somebody is putting themselves above others, like, hey, nothing bad's happened to me. So clearly I have no hidden sin, but you hear about those guys? That then prompts the response from Jesus. And he says this, do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all other people from Galilee, Jesus asked, is that why they suffered? And that sets up the answer from Jesus. And this is such an important piece. It's not the primary thing we're going to talk about, but it's something we are going to talk about. He says, not at all. He says, is that why they suffered? Not at all. You see, there's a really, really important point here. And this is something that some of us need to hear. And that point is this. You cannot connect hardship in life to your personal sin. You cannot do it. In other words, some of us <clears throat> have carried the guilt or the shame of our own sinful behaviors and have had some level of tragedy or hardship in life and we have thought 
I wonder if my circumstances are the fault of my sin. And what Jesus is saying is, not directly, no. Now, the truth is, is that all suffering is the cause of sin, right? Sin is the brokenness in the world that causes every bad thing to happen. All of us should hate sin, should strive not to sin, because every time sin is exposed to a situation, it only reaps havoc. It causes carnage in life, no matter what it is. Even if it doesn't seem like it, it just ruins things. But I've heard people say to me before, man, I, I was living this way before I found Christ and then, and then this thing happened in my life. And Jeff, is it because I lived this way that now I'm having to suffer here? My family member that has cancer or my child that died or whatever, is that because of my sin? And the answer is no, not directly. Because the power of the cross covers all sin. And God is not in the business of putting you under his heel because your sin is worse than someone else's. Because he knew you before you ever committed the sin that you committed that you can't get over because you think it's so evil and so bad. He knew you before then and chose to love you anyway. That's the power of the gospel for you is that when you were the most unlovely is when God chose to love you. And so let go of that shame and let go of that burden if that's something that you're carrying. The best example in the Bible of this is a man named Job. Uh, It's a fantastic book to read to understand the nature of suffering. And so it's in the Old Testament. I would encourage you to read it. Basically, the, the outline of the book is this. Job is this righteous man who is, tempt, or who is basically tortured by Satan right, um, for apparently no reason. He lived a great life. He, he had great spiritual practices. He loved God, and yet it was awful for him. His, all of his kids died. His wife basically abandoned him. All of his houses were destroyed. All of his wealth was taken away. And even his body was afflicted with sores and with pain for what seems like a really long period of time. And he, constantly he's crying out. He's saying, God, you know, wh- why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to me? And his friends say the very same thing that the crowd is insinuating in what they're asking. Jesus. His friends say, you must have done something that you're not telling us about because the righteous, they don't suffer the way you're suffering. But at the end of the book, God reprimands those friends and says, guys, you have no clue. And for three or four chapters at the end of Job, God unpacks why We can't comprehend every detail of life. He says, look, it's beyond you to know why things happen the way that they happen. You've got to trust me. And that's the issue with suffering. There is no way to tie suffering to one particular sin. I like this quote from R.T. France. A simplistic solution to the problem of evil that attributes suffering to the sufferer's sin is sub-Christian. It is sub-Christian, and we should never do it, period. Now, Jesus, from this point, launches into a completely different theme. Maybe you needed to hear that other piece about the suffering. If that's you, man, I would love to talk to you, and I would love to encourage you, but just know that God loves you, and that God is with you, and that no matter what you're navigating through, he's there, okay? But he completely flips it. Verse 3. So the beginning of verse three says, not at all. This is in the context of asking why they suffered. And then it says this, and you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. Verse four, and what about the 18 people who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them? 
Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. And so Jesus, he's creating this really, really interesting tie-in. He's taking their question and he's completely flipping it on its head and saying, yeah, that's not the real question. They're not the worst sinners, absolutely. But in the same way that they died, if you don't repent of your sins, then you will perish also. Now, certainly um, that's not in the context of life as we know it, because the truth is, is that unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to die. I'm sorry. I just, it's, it's just true. Okay. But what Jesus is saying is, unless you repent, unless you turn away from your sin, your sin, and more specifically turn toward God, then you're going to perish and be away from God forever. And that's something we don't like to talk about, but that's, that's hell is what that is. Now, the word that he uses in here is one that we're a little bit, I would say, unfamiliar with, and that's this term repent. And I'm going to try to unpack it really quickly for us here. Repenting at its base is to turn back or to turn away from something or to turn to something. It's this process of actually ceasing the direction that you're going and changing direction. Now, in this context, it's twofold. It's turning away from your sinful behavior not doing whatever that is anymore, and turning back toward God. Now, when I hear the word repent, the first few things that come to my mind is like feeling bad about the stuff I've done or apologizing, maybe recognizing that what I did I shouldn't have done and all those things are good. But repentance is about the action of making it better, of changing direction. But it's actually even a little bit deeper than that also. You see, at its core, repentance is a return to the covenant relationship that we have with God. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's returning to the way that things are meant to be. It's saying, God, I want to be back with you, recognizing that being with God is the greatest place that any of us could ever possibly be. And so repentance is turning away from living one way, turning back, running back into the arms of God, saying, I need you. I don't need whatever it was I was chasing in the place of you. Now, because we as Christ followers are still sinners, right? We are, you are, I am, right? Um, because repentance is coming back to God, we should be repenting all the time. In fact, according to Mark Boda, repentance is thus a way of life and is the way to experience, I love this, the abundance of life the Father intended, for which the Son suffered and into which the Spirit leads. I love this and I think it's so, so, so true. And it is the way to experience the abundance of life. It's not a way. It's not a good idea. It's not something that maybe you should consider once in a while. It is the way to live an abundant life. And so for some of us, we are stuck. For some of us, our walk with Jesus is stagnant. His voice in our lives is quiet. And while there could be many reasons for that, I would assert that perhaps it's because you need to repent. You need to take the direction that you're going. You need to cease. You need to turn back toward God and you need to run to him. That's a difficult decision, right? We're talking about tough decisions today. Repentance is always challenging because we have to come face to face with our own pride because we wouldn't go a direction that we don't value, whether it's the right direction or not. And so we've got to get into a heart position where we say, okay, I recognize that I want an abundant life and an abundant life only comes with following Jesus. It's not always an easy life, but it's always a full life. And therefore, back to that question I posed at the top, what is it that you're going to do?
Are you going to follow Jesus? Are you going to repent? Or are you going to continue to follow the direction you're going with the possibility of stagnation, of a life that's relatively boring and meaningless and whatever, blah, 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 fill in the blank? Or instead, are you going to turn to him? Now, this last section is bearing fruit. And I think it ties into this section about repentance. I'll try to tie it in here. Verses six through nine of chapter 13. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was fruit on it. But, it was, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. By the way, I'm gonna, I'll finish reading it here in a second. I totally have a couple of apple trees that are just like this. And it drives me bananas. Two of them. And I'm like, you guys better give me some apples or I'm cutting you down too. Threaten them with the Bible, you know. By the way, you shouldn't do that with people. You can do that with trees, but don't do that with people. Finally, he said to the gardener, I've waited three years and have been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs this next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Okay, and so... Um, One of the expectations for us as followers of Jesus, if you are one, if you're not, I hope you make that decision today. I think that'd be a really great idea. But one of the expectations of us is that our lives produce fruit. Um, Not like apples and oranges, but produce fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's from Galatians chapter 5. Right? That should be the hallmark of what our life looks like. We should have people in our lives that are turning to Jesus, that are being more closely discipled into relationship with him, simply because we are active and involved in what God's doing. Now, here's the thing. If you're not repenting of your sin, that can hinder this. If you're not turning away and turning back toward God, that can keep you as a barren tree instead of as a producing fig. And again, it comes with a little bit of a warning. Jesus is serious. Jesus absolutely is a loving, compassionate, caring God that wants you to be close to him and wants to hug you and wants to love you and you know, wants to carry you through your hard stuff, but he has some expectations on you too if you're a follower of Christ, okay? And so I'll go back to the question from the beginning again. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with Jesus, with who he is? If you haven't done something with him yet, I would encourage you to do so. To make a decision to follow him for the first time, that'd be awesome. What are you going to do with your lifestyle? If you're not chasing after him, are you going to turn from whatever it is you're chasing? An abundant life is waiting for you if you do. A fruitful life is waiting for you if you choose to. But that's a decision that you've got to make. And I know, I like to be comfortable and I don't like to make hard decisions. But you know what? Sometimes you just got to. And so in a second, I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite the worship team up. Um, But it's really, really important, I think, when we have a challenge like this to have an opportunity to respond, okay? And so I want to give you two ways that you can potentially respond. One is during this last song, if you feel so led, I would encourage you to come up to the front. Come up and pray. If you need to confess that you've been chasing something other than God, you can do so would encourage you to do that. If that's a little bit too much for you, then I would encourage you to grab a card that says, let's connect. You can write your name on there. And if you need to, you can write on the back if you want to confess it. If you want to confess it and not put your name, right? With the, hey, I've been living after blah, 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 blah. And I want to turn toward Christ. You don't have to put your name. God knows. That might be an option for you as well, okay? And so I would encourage you here in a minute, as I pray, after I pray, as the worship team sings over us, You can come to the front, you can pray, you can confess, you can get your heart right with God. You can choose to turn back to an abundant life. Or if you've never said yes to Jesus before, you can come forward and do that also. Or you can snag a card and you can put it in one of the boxes as you leave. Both options are great. But man, I would just encourage you to step forward and step into something new today. God, thank you for your word and for encouraging and challenging us through it. And 
I pray that um, that our hearts would be stirred toward you. That we would choose to repent. To let go of our sinful lives, of our sinful behaviors. To change our life and move towards you. Lord, if if some of us in the room have not yet made a decision like that to follow you at all, I pray that that would be something that we would have the courage to do today. Even to perhaps even ask some different kinds of questions than what we've been asking. Lord, you are so good and you have been so good to us. So I pray that you would be here now. Help us, Lord, to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.